70 years ago on December 8, 1940, the Washington Redskins hosted the Chicago Bears in the NFL Championship game. For the first time, a NFL Championship game was being broadcast nationally to 120 radio stations across the country. It was a rematch of a game won by the Redskins 7-3 three weeks earlier. Perhaps the fans on hand at Griffith Stadium were looking forward to a defensive battle between the league's top two teams. But just three plays into the game, there was a sense that this might not be a low-scoring affair, at least for the Bears. As Bill Osmanski took a handoff, ran around the right end, and exploded for a 68-yard touchdown run to put the Bears out in front 7-0. The very next series, the Redskins' Sammy Baugh drilled a 35-yard TD pass to Charlie Malone at the goal line, but Malone dropped the ball. The Redskins then missed a 32-yard field goal attempt, and that was it. For on this day, it was all Chicago. Bears coach George Hallis implemented the T-formation in place of the normal single-wing offense being used in the NFL at that time. His quarterback, Hall of Famer Sid Luckman, ran the T to perfection. The result? The most lopsided game in NFL history. Chicago had a 28-0 lead by halftime and continued to pour it on throughout the second half as they added 26 points in the third quarter and 19 in the fourth to defeat the Redskins 73-0. The Monsters of the Midway weren't just about offense as the Bears defense recorded a playoff record eight interceptions. Three of those picks were returned for TDs. The scoring onslaught was so great that there were no more game balls to be used. The Bears had kicked them all into the stands on extra points throughout the afternoon. In fact, Washington pleaded with the Bears not to attempt point afters on their last two TDs. The game was finished using practice balls. Perhaps the day was best summed up by Washington's Hall of Fame quarterback, Sammy Baugh. When asked by a reporter after the game whether the outcome would have been different had Malone not dropped that TD pass early in the game, slinging Sammy replied, sure, it would have been 73-7. to Is it true you were, your sophomore year, you uh, think you have the all-time record, don't you, for yardage? Right, uh, and uh, it still stands today, and it also... Back then we played both ways, and uh, I still hold the record going both ways, you know. And uh, you were defensive back, Harry. Defensive back who played safety. And you went to a couple bowl games, didn't you? Yeah, when, uh, when I was with West Virginia, I, I played one bowl game. That was with uh, the Sun Bowl. And you beat what? Texas Tech. Beat Texas Tech seven six. Now, from uh, your four years at West Virginia, what years were those? Finished in forty. Then what happened? I was uh, drafted by the Bears, I think, about number 11th round. Okay, now who, who was the guy that sort of recommended you to the Bears? Joe Steidahar. How did that work out? Uh, he and I were good friends. I met him when he came back to school. He was in pro football then, but he had a, he came back two extra years to pick up his uh, degree, you know. And in the meantime, I roomed with him one year, and we got to know him real good. And he sort of took me under his wing. So we became real good friends. And you were with the Bears for how long? I was with the Bears four years. Four years. I'm going to show you something that I stumbled across about uh, about a month ago and see if you recognize some of these guys. A little bit about Bulldog here. Uh, he, he's considered one of the best linemen, uh, uh, linebackers in, in pro football. And uh, I just saw recently Bulldog Turner and uh, Bill George and uh, what was the other guy? And uh, starts with a B. Butkus. Mm -hmm. The three greatest linebackers that the Bears ever had, and they, and they were good. And Joseph Meal, he uh, he played with uh, Purdue, and then came up with the Bears. And uh, Joe came up the same year as I, and uh, he he broadcast after seasons were over. He was a sports uh, broadcaster, and. Since then, uh, Joe's died. Mm -hmm. Bill Hughes. Bill Hughes played uh, center, and uh, Bill wasn't with us too long, and, uh, and uh, actually didn't get to be too good of friends with Bill, but he was a great athlete. Hamp Poole. Hamp Poole, uh, 
he played with me with the Bears four years, and then uh, he coached at the uh, Los Angeles Rams. Uh, he and Steinhauer, Steinhauer was a head coach, and Hamp was his assistant. Al Matuza was from Georgetown, mm -hmm. great center, and a uh, real good ball player. He always uh, gave all he had, and it was always pretty consistent. Ray Nolding, he's the best the Bears ever had. He was from Cincinnati, and he, he was a he could hit those holes fast. And quick start, you know, a quick start. He'd be in the back, in the secondary before he knew it. Then you have Joe Steidahar here. Joe Steidahar, well, just like a brother to me. He was from West Virginia, and it seemed like West Virginians were kind of kind to you. They, <laughs> they just sort of fit in. They were just regular people. But Joe's one of the great ones. Bob Schneider, I room one, I room with Bob one year, and. Uh, when he was uh, with the Cleveland Rams, that's before the Rams moved out to the coast. They moved to the coast and called themselves the L.A. Rams. But Bob was with the Cleveland Rams, and uh, Part Lewis was the coach then. So uh, t two games that the Cleveland Rams played the Bears, the Rams beat them. Snyder was a quarterback. So, so what, what did Hellas do? But he bought <laughs> Snyder and benched him. So his quarterback was uh, was uh, uh, Sid Luckman, you know, and Charlie O'Rourke was the other quarterback, and Snyder was the third one. But he was a, he he could do anything. Bob could. He was a great extra point kicker, field goal kicker, and he, he's from uh, Toledo. Young Bussy, he came up from LSU. He played with Ken Cavanaugh. They were mm -hmm. teammates back there. He was a passer for Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh, and he set all kinds of records. Bussy was with us two years, and uh, when he went into the service, uh, into the theater of war, he lost his life. So uh, I only got to play with uh, Bussy about two mm -hmm. years. Get down to Ken Cavanaugh here. Ken Cavanaugh holds all kinds of records in, in the NFL, and uh, uh, he's just great. He just uh, could relax and grab that ball out of the air about anyway. And he was an end? He was an end? Played in, right. And it very seldom dropped in. Ray McLean, they used to call him Scooter McLean. He was from St. Anselm's. It's a real small school. And uh, he weighed about 160. Ray could uh, drop kick, you know, like they do extra points now. He'd, he'd just drop kick him. And uh, fast, real fast. Uh, made, made a lot of touchdowns at the end of passes and thrown by Sid Luckman. And uh, he just. Seemed to get the jump on anyone, mm -hmm. just, like, just like Rice is uh, present with the 49ers. Yes. John Fedorovich, uh, I played against him in high school. He went to a small school in Fayette County called Redstone. I don't, you probably don't even, never heard of it. But uh, later on, he uh, came with the Bears. He was about 6'10, six, uh, six but weighed about 285. Mm. Tough end. Not much of an offensive end, but uh, very good on defense. Ray Bray, one of the best guards uh, that ever played in the NFL. Tough, he was real tough. And, and Danny Fortman, Danny Fortman, he was he graduated from Colgate when he was 17. One of the all-time, uh, all-time uh, guards with the Bears. Mm -hmm. And uh, Danny later on became a surgeon, good surgeon. They, they lived in California after the his playing days were over, and his two sons became doctors. So then we go on down here to Harold Lair. Harold Lair, uh, Lair. He played one year with us, and uh, he was a good guard. He, he was understudy for Danny Fordman. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harold played one year, then he went elsewhere. Was, uh, someone uh, made a trade for him, and I never ran into him anymore. Ed Coleman was uh, with. Uh, with us, and uh, he was a great, great tackle. He, he was an understudy for Steinar. And uh, I'll have to tell you the story here. Uh, Sam Huff, you know, West Virginia Absolutely. tackle, yeah. he, he became great. But anyhow, Ed Coleman tells me the story when Sam was up there with the New York Giants. Ed was a line coach. Mm -hmm. And every night, Sam would start well, pining away for his home. He was homesick, you know, wanted to go home. And, he used to get on to him and tell me, grow up, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, he finally stayed and 
And so I'd say Cohen had a lot to do with his uh, success. Gary Famiglietti, Famiglietti was a fullback from Boston University. He was like a firefly guy. I think he was 6'1 and weighed about 270, hard to tackle. And he was one of these more or less like a tank. He just, instead of hitting the hole, he did two or three players. He liked to run over it. And uh, Gary, I think he had about five or six years with the, with the Bears. And it could dash back a few. And I think he's one of the greatest halfbacks that I've ever seen or played with. He could do anything. He could kick and uh, pass. and just just one of those tricky left-handers, and uh, he holds a lot of records there with the Bears. And Joe Maniacci, Joe Maniacci, he, he was from, uh, I think Joe went to Fordham, and uh, he was an amateur golfer, champion in New Jersey for about three straight years, hmm. real good golfer. Anyhow, Joe played fullback with uh, the Bears, and uh, he was the understudy for uh, uh, Norm Stanley was there at the time, and uh, the two of them sort of split up to fullback duties. George Wilson next. He, he and I roomed together. George Wilson. He, he was from Northwestern, and uh, toughest one of the toughest ends in football. He might kill the uh, Tuffy Lehmans mm -hmm. on a tackle. Tuffy Lehmans caught this pass and just turn around ready to go down the field and uh, uh, George hit him head on and, uh, and uh, Tuffy Lemus was considered real tough then but he almost died on the field he got hit so hard he yes. got hit in the, in the Adam's apple he couldn't breathe but uh, later on he came around he got uh, Bob Nowoski Bob Nowoski was from Mount Pleasant Pennsylvania and uh, played at George Washington University and then came to the Bears and uh, I played against Bob in high school, college, and pro football. And uh, when he came with the Bears, uh, he and I became real good friends. And uh, Bob's dead now, but he was a great, great, great end. He played defensive end. And here's Al Bizey. Al Bizey was from West Virginia, and he was in my class. And uh, he got drafted by the Bears, and he played the guard. And, uh, after he retired from football, he uh, took over the business of his in-laws. They had a tavern up in Minneapolis, and uh, one night he was going home, and uh, I guess there's a couple guys pulled up alongside him at a stoplight, because he always took the money home every night, and they probably knew that. They shot him with a shotgun right in the face and blinded him. Uh -huh. So he, I've, I've been to a couple reunions and have seen him, and he's just looks real good and uh, real healthy, but his eyesight's gone, but yeah. uh, still the same old Al Bizey. The guy you didn't mention. Yeah, well, uh, the name spell wrong. <laughs> <laughs> did you go by, you didn't go by Clark, C-L-A-R-K, did you? Huh? Is that your signature? Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, when I was in, when I was in, uh, is this your stage name here, Clark? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I was in, uh, High school, I'd always spell my name C L A R K E, you know, and uh, went along till the, the writers just dropped E, made C L A R K. So when I went to uh, high school and graduated, it didn't have the E on it, so I just continued to C L A R K. <laughs> and uh, after I got, got out of college and went into the Navy, you know, I had to have an affidavit and all that to change my name back to what it should be C L A R K E, and. Uh, so a lot of people, when I came back out of the service, I just kept the E, you know. And uh, a lot of people thought I was kind of high hat, changing the name and all that crap. But anyhow, <laughs> funny thing, my mother's name was C-L-A-R-K. Dad's was C-L-A-R-K-E. Oh, no kidding. Isn't that a coincidence? Oh. So uh, that's the way it happened. And so uh, I just stayed with the E now. When Bronco uh, came back, uh, you know, he had played with the Bears and had retired. And then during the war, they had a hard time getting players, you know. Mm -hmm. So that, that was in 43. Palace brought him back, and he played fullback. He, he was still like a tank. He was in pretty good shape. and uh, But I really enjoyed that. Being able to play the Bronco and Agurse, one of the legends, you know. So and when they, and they, uh, he would have played with you when, 40? 43. He was 43. Yeah. 
Was that your last year at yeah, Chicago? Yes, that was my last year at the Bears also. Okay. And uh, so... Uh, was he also, did he also play linebacker that year, or was he just one way? Just one way, he just ran it. Yeah. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The largest crowds on December 7, 1941, were at the three stadiums where NFL games were being played. The Giants at the Polo Grounds were playing the Brooklyn Football Dodgers. One of the Giants players, named Jack Loomis, eventually became one of the NFL players who saw duty and died four years later in Iwo Jima. The game in Chicago was the biggest NFL game of that day. There was a good crowd for that game. December the 7th, that's when the Jets attacked at Pearl Harbor. Remember that day we were playing the Chicago Cardinals? Mm -hmm. Nergursky was on the team we were playing that day, I mean, uh, on our team. And uh, somehow they, they had us about 14 points. And uh, then, then this uh, announcement came over this, the system, you know. They stopped the game and said, the, the Japs have attacked at Pearl Harbor, you know. Everyone just went down, you know, just uh, like being struck by a bomb themselves. And uh, so it took us about a half hour before they got the game going again. And it uh, wasn't long till we started to make it some progress, and Bronk would go eight or ten yards, and 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 uh, Luckman would throw me a pass, maybe ten or twelve yards, and we just sort of got back, and we ended up winning the game. Probably and uh, I'll never forget that day because that, that was a lot of excitement, you know. The divisional playoff a week later drew more than 40,000 people. But after the Bears beat the Packers, they qualified for the NFL championship game on December 21. By then, the war effort was up and running. There was only about 13,000 people that showed up, the smallest attendance ever of an NFL championship game. When you got the announcement, I find that fascinating. I mean, you were part of history. Yeah, well, uh, they stopped the game and, and, and made the announcement. And uh, a lot of things go through your mind. I said, well, I guess. This is the end of my career and things like that. My wife is in the stands also. I, I can see her getting excited and all that. I'd have to leave and uh, we had two children, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things uh, you start thinking about. But anyhow, uh, we got through that all right and all that. Then uh, after the season was over, I went, I went to service. Mm -hmm. But people left the stadium knowing that something terrible had happened and sensing that nothing was ever going to be quite the same. Sid Luckman uh, was from Columbia, and uh, he's a Jewish boy, and uh, real, real good all around. He, he could uh, play safety and uh, bring those punts back just as good as any punt return we had, you know, and uh, he, he, he uh, did his share of tackling, and. Uh, like Sammy Ball. Sammy Ball used to be at the Washington Redskins. Mm -hmm. I, I rate him as one of the best quarterbacks I've ever played against. But and Sammy was the same way. He, he, he uh, wasn't built uh, real heavy, but he was kind of thin. But he'd get in there and tackle and block and everything. I remember the first time I uh, uh, we were playing Green Bay. I think maybe the, I was about the third and a half back then. I was, they had Dolting and then they had uh, uh, Bobby Swisher and me. I was a rookie, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was the third the left half. There was three right halves and three left halves. And they had about three uh, positions, uh, uh, three men for each position. So anyhow, uh, when I got into the first game I ever played in uh, pro football, it was against Green Bay. So uh, Luckman calls a quick opener. That's just dead ahead, you know, mm -hmm. screen blocking, and you just hit the hole real fast. Anyhow, as soon as I got through the hole, someone hit me right in the mouth. Hit me in the mouth, I just grabbed my mouth. I thought all my teeth were gone, and uh, I dropped a ball, you know. So as soon as that was over, Alice stopped the picture. He said, well, I might as well tell you rookies about this. He says, up here, the ball comes first. Don't worry about your teeth. Don't worry about your looks or anything. He said, hold on to that ball. And every year, the training camp, he'd show that picture. He said, this is what you don't do, you know. And I thought all my teeth were gone. But, yeah. uh, well, did they have films back then? I mean, they uh, yeah, yeah, game yeah, films? Yeah, 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 we had game films, yeah. They had a big fire in, uh, I think, in uh, 
44, 45, and he lost all their films. Okay. He, he was the owner, yeah, he was the sole owner. So he's, I mean, you had to not only play for the guy, but you had to negotiate with the guy. Right, yeah, he had you both ways, you know. Was he as tough as they say? Tough, tough. And, and, and uh, he said, well, if you have a good year, and I think he had a good year, he says, you'll get a bonus, you know. So those bonuses uh, weren't too, uh, too uh, heavy. I think uh, most I ever got a bonus was around five hundred dollars. You know, if you have a good year. What was the most you ever made in, in professional football? Twelve thousand dollars. Twelve thousand dollars. Now that was with the Bears or what? Dons. Yeah. You know, nowadays uh, they make more money in the uh, meal money than we did in salaries. Yes. Yeah. Does that bother you? Yeah, no, I, I'd have played for nothing. You know, yeah. someone asked me that question. I said Harry he says. Uh, uh, how well do you like pro football? I said, well, i tell you what, I, I like it so well, I'd play for nothing. So this guy said, well, if you're playing for the Bears, you're playing for nothing. Because <laughs> <laughs> back then, Art Rooney and Alice were the lowest Bears in the league. Yeah, yeah. You were involved in perhaps the most uh, noteworthy game uh, in football, the, the Redskins championship game. Mm -hmm. give, us, give, us, give us a little bit about that. That was in 1940, and uh, I was a rookie that year. And, uh, Three weeks before that, we met him in a just a regular scheduled game, and they beat us seven to three. And after the end of the season, all that the the, the, now, the, the Redskins at the time had Sammy Ball, right? Sammy Ball, yes. And uh, they had a great team. So anyhow, uh, we met him three weeks later in the championship game, and uh, it just seemed like everything uh, went good for us. Anyhow, we kicked off to them. They got the ball, all that, and. Uh, I got down to about the 25-yard line, and Sammy Ball hit this end, Malone, in the end zone, right in his hands, the ball, and he drops it, you know. Yeah. So anyhow, they didn't score. We stopped him, and, and a lot of times, uh, Sammy Ball has been asked, Sammy, if that Malone had kept that ball instead of fumbling, he said, what do you think the score would have been? He said, 73 to 6. <laughs> Before the game, did, did George talk to you about it? Did George get you Oh, yeah, he, fired up? He, he was like uh, uh, Hunk Anderson. You know, he was an old Notre Dame. Yeah. He coached Notre Dame. He was from Notre Dame. And he and the house would just get us ready to, we could almost fly without wings, you know. But they've really worked you up. Things got going. We were intercepting passes and just couldn't do anything wrong. And uh, I think at halftime, we were about 28 nothing. Uh, at halftime, then the rest of it uh, just kept piling up in the second half. And uh, finally at the last quarter, uh, the beginning of the last quarter, the, the referee came over and says, from now on, if you score, you either run it over or pass it over. This is the last football we have, you know, because you'd kick it and you'd never get it back. You know how that is. So I made the last touchdown. Uh, Bob Snyder, the, the you have his name on that list. Yeah. He, he said, who hasn't scored yet? I said, I haven't. And, and I'd already scored, you know. He brings us up all the time. <laughs> so after the game was over and all, he said, how's Kevin you said that here? He said, you scored. I said, well, I said, people remember me now because I scored more than one time. I was the only <laughs> one that scored twice. During 13 years of high school, college, and professional football, Red Grange carried the ball 4,013 times for an average of 8.1 yards and scored 531 touchdowns. Yeah, well, my first year up there, he was the backfield coach at training camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got to know him pretty well. He was a quiet person. He, he was, he was kind of hard to know, you know. Mm -hmm. He'd stand back. And, but uh, I was probably the same way. I was sort of a quiet person person myself and we seemed to get along pretty well and uh, I guess he was one of the greatest legends uh, that ever was. Tell us about your equipment. We didn't have much did you? you know, we didn't have much in the way of equipment and uh, everything was sort of clumsy like your pads in your pants they didn't fit tight or anything like that. Leather headgear, no face no masks. Face masks. No. Do you have a mouth guard? No, no mouth guards. They're just plain. Travel. We traveled by train when I was with the Bears, and after the war, we, uh, we went 
by air, I went by plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was with the Dodds, we went by plane. And uh, what a difference, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, like when I was in college, we, when we played the Sun Bowl, you know, I think they sent us down to Texas in a cattle car back then. <laughs> the, that, that's about what it felt like, and that's what we all kidded each other about. It. We went by cattle car down to the Sun Bowl. At Ventura, California, the Los Angeles Dons turn out for training under President Don Amici and coach Jim Phelan. In spring or summer, a young gritter used to be pretty fancy with the tackling dummy and vice versa. And the Dons show us the old-fashioned system. He had four years with the Bears, then went into the service, came back out of the service and joined the, what team? Los Angeles Dons. And they were owned by? Don Amici and Big Crosby and Bob Hope. Now, was that the... Uh, Plus Mr. Lenheimer. Mr. Lenheimer was, uh, I think he was head of the stock exchange in, in Chicago, mm -hmm. and he had controlling enters. And, and was it just a brand new league at the time, or was yeah, just a new league after the war? Uh -huh. now, did did you have a chance to go back to the Bears at that time, or uh... well, I called uh, Mr. Hallis up and asked him uh, what kind of raise I was going to get, you know. He said, well, he said, since you all been in, in service, he said, you know, your reflexes aren't as good as they used to be and all that. He said, I'm signing everyone up to the same contract they had when they left. Wonderful. So I said, well, I believe it. I said, goodbye. So I, I joined, the, that's why they paid me 12000 a year, the Dodge. Yeah. Now, was that, uh, did a lot of NFL players, when they came back to service, join yeah. the league? On, on the Dons, there was 11 Bears that played with the Dons. I'll be there. That's how many left the left, uh, house. Was it a substantially different uh, caliber of ball? Yeah, it was about the same, about yeah. the same, yes. Because uh, the, Bear, the Bears won the championship uh, you know, the next year after the war, 46. Mm -hmm. And if, we'd have been there, if, if I'd have been there, it would have been another championship. But uh, he, uh, he wanted to give me 9,000. I had a chance to get you know, three more thousand. Uh, quite a raise back then. Sure. Plus said I got a three year contract that couldn't be traded or sold unless I consented it, mm -hmm. you know. Well you were a star then. You get to well, get that kind of contract. Yeah, well you are just lucky. Now did you have much contact at all with, with the the uh, Amici and Crosby and then Well Amici used to I used to have him I used to be the, the captain, you know. And every Monday I'd have a conversation with Mr. Amici. If you lost you wanna know what yeah. Cause it and all that, and if you want to, uh, how's the boys feel and all that. But just like him, meet someone for coffee every Monday morning, you know, just hashing it out. In fact, one of the articles I've got at home, I don't know if I shared with you, is a, is a sports page, and, and you scored a couple touchdowns against Buffalo, and they were talking about you. Yeah, I, I, I think I ran 82 yards against Buffalo that, you know, that game. I, I had a pretty good day that one time. Yeah, they still talk about you in Buffalo. And uh, <laughs> what's his name? Uh, Rex Bumgarner from West Virginia played with Buffalo. Was oh, right. Mm -hmm. Buffalo Bills, because I tried to sign him with when I was with L.A. Is that right? Yeah. Because he was from West Virginia, they told me to get on his trail and sign him up, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, Buffalo signed him. And from there, you, you ended up your career where? I ended up, uh, well, when I left, I left the Dons, uh, after I got hurt my last year with the Dons, and I went from there to the Chicago Rockets. They were owned by Mr. Lindheimer also. He had control of the others, you know. I was Mr. Lindheimer's right-hand man. If he hadn't died, I'd have been in the car agency in L.A. Oh, he was going to put me in the Ford agency in, the, in the L.A. And uh, he and Henry Ford were real good friends. Henry Ford would give him three cars every year, you know, just to drive. He'd get a Lincoln and, yeah. and a Mercury and a, and a Ford yeah, free every year. So anyway, I said, when you're through at playing there, he says, I'm going to put you on Charlie O'Rourke in the, in the Ford Agency in, in L.A. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, he ups and dies after I go with the Rockets. 57 years old, he had a hard time oh, dying. So you coached that last year? Did you play and coach? I played played and coached, yeah. Yeah. And uh, our biggest game, the first game I went back to the Rockets, Played coach, we, we played the Baltimore Colts. They were undefeated. We beat them. We just sort of had a half-assed team more or less, you know. I mean, yeah. we, 
you know how occasions uh, come and go, and yeah. we just rose up and beat them. And that, that was quite a feat to beat uh, the Colts undefeated then. Right. I just belonged to two, just uh, Maryland, the state of Maryland, and also the state of West Virginia, and they're working on Pennsylvania now. Telling us that uh, you played defensive back, and one of the guys that you had to cover was Don Hudson. Tell us yeah, a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah. Well, this is the first first game that uh, Danny Banyani, we acquired him from the Cleveland Rams, and uh, he was a good defensive man. So anyhow, uh, he was covering Hudson and he running down the field uh, with with uh, Don and uh, side by side, and Don runs right at the goalpost, and just as he goes past the goalpost, he grabs it, grabs a pipe and spins up right underneath the goal yeah. post, you know, and Danny's still going. <laughs> so he, he catches the ball for a touchdown in the house. I don't think he let him play for about the next three games. There you go. But, uh, Great move. You never expect a guy to do that. Yeah. And this Hudson, a lot of times, he would get down on his hands and knees like a baseball catcher, mm -hmm. and this guy hit him right there. No way to cover him, no way to get to the ball. That was the quarterback, was that Cecil Isabel? It's Cecil Isabel, yes. Otto Graham. Otto mm -hmm. Graham was great. And the Cleveland Browns were great. They were always tough. Was that Lavelli? Lavelli, yeah. Mary Motley? Mary Motley, yes. Mary Motley, yeah. Uh, I hit Mary Motley one time. I didn't even slow him up. Uh, <laughs> we were playing him, and I, I was a safety man. I had him pinned against the side, and I was going to kill him, you know. I put a flying block into him. When I came to, he was across <laughs> the goal line. I was out for about 10 minutes. It's the hardest I've ever been hit. But he, he's a good friend of mine, this Mayor Motley. Yeah. Uh, we used to go down at the uh, convention down to Florida every year, and uh, he'd always come out with him. He'd get that red cap. I don't know where he'd get it. He'd run up to me, Mr. Clark, I'll get your bags. You know, get... How about the Chicago Cardinals? Anybody of note there that you remember? Yeah, Marshall Goldberg was there. Uh, he was from Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, he was from Pitt. He's from West Virginia, you know. The day he went from uh, Elkins, West Virginia, to Pitt. I left Uniontown and came to Morgantown. Oh, we don't. This sort of made a cross. And you, how many championship games did you play in? Well, when I was with the Bears, I was in three out of four years there. And the, and the year we didn't win, uh, we were undefeated that year. Oh, we don't. That's uh, right. Now, who did you lose to that year? Well, undefeated uh, Redskins beat us. Redskins? And we couldn't even score a touchdown, and we set all kinds of records, and, you know, high-scoring games and all that. The only way we scored, they beat us, uh, I think they beat us 21-7, uh, to 7 and we picked up a fumble, and that's the only way we scored.